So we're going to have a look at the bonding in benzene uh, and when we finish that we're going to move on to the first mechanism in the benzene specification which is the mononitration of benzene. We'll have a look very quickly at the, bo the bonding of benzene and what you need to understand about, uh, about it and why it uh, infers a significant amount of stability within benzene that you may not actually expect. So let's look at benzene first and f firstly. So it is a hexagon and you need to know that it is that. So its shape is hexagonal. It's a flat molecule. So it's hexagonal planar and it has a circle in the middle which represents a delocalized pi bonding system. So essentially what we have here are one, two, three, four, five, six bonds. Each of those bond angles, if you haven't worked it out, is 120 degrees. And we have on each carbon one hydrogen. So we have a molecular formula, C6H6, an empirical formula of CH. So originally benzene it was discovered way back in about 1825 by a guy called Michael Faraday. Uh, they had great sort of difficulty back in that time trying to work out the structure of benzene. Uh, anything up until then had, uh, in terms of chemistry had been studied, had been aliphatic chemistry. And aliphatic chemistry is the sort of the chemistry you've studied so far. You're talking about things in chains and branches. Okay, this was the first time where they'd come across a structure which actually behaved in a cy or carbon structure which behaved in a cyclical uh, fashion. So instead of aliphatic, this is now we're into what we'd call aromatic chemistry, and benzene is belongs to a family aromatics call the arenes. Okay. So specifically in a level benzene uh, forms a majority of the aromatic chemistry that we look at. So the structure of it was, was pretty difficult to work out. Um, along came a, I think a French scientist then about 40 years later in about 1865 um, uh, a scientist called Kekulé and what Kekulé did was he, he decided that um, he would have a look at the structure of benzene and see if he could actually start to put something together that would actually solve the riddle of the structure of benzene. So what Kekulé decided was that he hypothesized that benzene was a, of highly unsaturated hydrocarbon. It had three carbon-carbon double bonds and had a, essentially a structure like that. And then if you, you draw that out, you'll see that sits really quite nicely with C686. But there were some problems with the, the, the Kekulé structure. Um, main problem was that if it had three carbon-carbon double bonds, it should undergo um, electrophilic attack really very readily and it should undergo electrophilic addition reactions okay unfortunately it, it didn't um, it should also have three carbon carbon double bonds which are shorter and then three carbon carbon single bonds which are longer however on the onset of x-ray crystallography where we were capable to or able to, to measure these bond lengths we actually found that all the bond lengths in this molecule were the same okay um, the next problem was that if i take a unsaturated hydrocarbon let's let's say um, i take a, a what's called cyclohexene so we, we've got a cyclic compound with one genuine carbon carbon double bond in it and if i hydrogenate that to a compound called cyclohexane, which is just as, as you would expect, C6H12, two hydrogens per carbon, and I'll draw them all in. 
Okay. The energy change in that was in around minus 125 kilojoules per mole. So if Kekulé's structure up here was correct, we would anticipate that. Hopefully, you can see why we need. Th we would have done this to get us to our cyclohexane complete hydrogenation, and we should have got three times minus one two five kilojoules of energy in this instance. So we should be in and around exothermic reaction of about three seventy five kilojoules of energy. In actual fact, what we got was about minus 208 kilojoules of energy so we were missing 160 odd kilojoules of energy which is a really very significant quantity of energy to to go missing in any chemical reaction so that kind of threw Kekulé's structure as good as it was and as novel as his thinking was it kind of threw it out the the window a little bit so i suppose the question is well what what then really is the the structure of this this benzene that um, we're talking about. Well, what eventually got decided upon was that if we look at the carbons in here, we have, of course, uh, six carbons. We know that every carbon has four bonding electrons, four valence electrons. We know that every single carbon is bonded to, and if we just use this one here maybe as an example, is bonded to one carbon going that way, one carbon going that way, and the hydrogen going that way. So we know that three electrons are used in that manner to make what you should understand as head-on overlap of orbitals, and those are sigma bonds, Okay, two of them to adjacent carbons, one to an adjacent hydrogen. And that leaves us then with one electron left. Now what was deduced about that electron was that that electron resided in a p orbital. So every, oh, excuse my artwork, every electron, every, sorry, every carbon in here has an electron in this p orbital. Now, I, I'm not going to draw all of these in. Well, maybe I will actually. Okay. I'll, so we ended up with six electrons in these p orbitals. So we've one times six. So we have six electrons in that those p orbitals. And what happened then was these p orbitals can get so close together that they can actually completely overlap in a ring. And that's what happened. We ended up getting an overlap of these p orbitals. And those of you who remember from AS. You now have a uh, one delocalized, and this is an important word here, because those electrons are spread across the entirety of that benzene molecule. One delocalized pi bond, okay, and that is caused by, if you can remember, the sideways overlap of the p, the six p orbitals okay now we talked a bit about p orbitals in as chemistry and we talked about them in this sort of context here and we established that these were very attractive to electrophiles okay which were either positive or delta positive and the reason was because they had a, a high area of very high dense negative charge <laughs> and the pi bond in there was relatively weak however what we're doing here then is we're taking those p orbitals and we're spreading them across the entirety of the molecule so we are reducing the density of that negative charge okay that also means that any repulsion felt by the pi bonds in here from the sigma bond in this region here was decreased. The in the, the sort of the in the end of the day, then what that meant was that it took more energy. So it takes much more energy to break 
this delocalized knotted again. I, oh, you'll hear me really pronounce that delocalized pi bonding system. All right. And it's much less attractive to electrophile. If I have an electrophile here, okay, it's much less attractive to this area here because we've spread the negative charge around the entirety of the molecule. Whereas down here between these two carbons in this pi bond, the negative charge is localized between the two carbons. So it's a very dense area of negative charge. So the long shot is that this delocalized pi bonding system that you actually do have in benzene requires much more energy to break. And if we go back to what I said earlier, whenever we were talking about the Kekulé's structure and why Kekulé's structure perhaps didn't quite cut it. What happened with Kekulé was that when we carried out this hydrogenation of benzene, we were actually somehow had gone and lost about two, I'm uh, sorry, about 160 kilojoules of energy. And the reason for that is because in genuine bending, instead of having these three double bonds, what we actually have is this delocalized pi bonding system represented by a circle like that. And that delocalized bonding system requires much more energy to break than these three carbon carbon double bonds that Kekulé had pr predicted. And that simply means that you've got to put much more energy into your reaction. And if you've got to put much more energy in, then overall, remember, the net amount of energy given out is less because the, the delta H of a reaction, which this is, is a balance between the energy in and the energy out. And you're getting much less energy out than you would perhaps anticipate because you're having to put much more energy in. So that's that's the bonding okay that's how you would describe the bonding okay you will be asked sort of how many electrons are in the delocalized pi bonding system sometimes a lot of people get those wrong if i if you go up you'll see that we have six electrons in the delocalized pi bonding system one from each of the p orbitals very often asked how many electrons are in the total um molecule well every single carbon in there has got four electrons so if you think of it that way, from that perspective, you've got 24 electrons alone. Then you've also got your hydrogens, which are not drawn in here. So we might draw in our six hydrogens. Remember, every hydrogen has one electron. So you've got six electrons from there. So the total number of electrons are bonding electrons. Because, because remember, the delocalized pi bonding system, it's still a bond. And there are still six electrons in it. So you would get a 30 electrons in total in that in that benzene molecule bonding. Right, let's have a look at the mechanism then for the nitration of benzene. Okay, so on your syllabus, you have to be able to draw a mechanism, talk about the reagents, talk about the electrophile and the conditions for the mononitration of benzene. A mononitration is represented by one nitro group being added in inorganic chemistry a nitro group is well we'll see what a nitro group is now it's a it's an no2 group okay and what you'll see there then is that i have taken off from my benzene ring i have got if i drew out the molecular formula here i've removed a uh, hydrogen so I have carried out a substitution reaction here. The conditions for this are less than 50 degrees Celsius. The reason for that, and you need to know it, is that above 50 degrees Celsius, I start getting multiple nitro groups added. Okay, more likely dye in nitro, probably not as many as I just put on there. Okay, the other condition for this reaction is that you need not just conk and us, conk nitric acid, I should say there. You also use conk sulfuric acid and the conch sulfuric acid doesn't you won't see it in the uh, balance symbol equation because it's a catalyst it does take part in the reaction but it is regenerated at the end and we'll, we'll have a look at how it's regenerated at the end so this reaction is as you may have already picked up it's an electrophilic reaction 
So the electrophile is attracted to that area of dense negative charge in the delocalized pi bonding system. And it's electrophilic substitution. As, you, as I said over, over here, we remove the hydrogen, replace it with a, a nitro group. So let's have a look. First part that you have to know about this is how do you actually make the electrophile? Any four mechanisms for the benzene chemistry. And you need to be able to know how to make the electrophile in all four instances. The good thing about it is once you have the electrophile made, uh, the mechanism is pretty much the same for all four mechanisms. So you just take a different electrophile, but it does pretty much the same thing. Okay, so here the electrophile is made by conch nitric acid. We don't write conch in the equation, but I'm just reminding you because if you are asked an equation, or sorry, a question as to what the reagents are, you must say conch nitric and conch sulfuric acid, not just nitric and uh, sulfuric acid. Okay, so we make our um, electrophile. Our electrophile is, and um, this is again a word you need to know, it's a nitronium ion, I think it's also called nitrile ion at times, but nitronium ion is the, the one that I would see, or that you will see most. And we get that. So that's an equation that you guys will need to know. You'll see variations of this equation, by the way, out there. So just uh, bear in mind that uh, you, if you do see something slightly, slightly different, don't don't worry. It's all the uh, all the same. You can maybe take a wee second there and balance that that equation if you wanted. Pause the video. Not exactly difficult. Okay, so let's have a look at this, how this nitronium ion then interacts with the benzene ring. So well, let's just draw our benzene ring. Let's draw our delocalized pi bonding system in the middle. Let's approach it with the nitronium ion. And let's start putting in curly arrows as the examiner will expect. So it's the delocalized pi bonding system, which is represented by this ring. And remember, the electrons move from where they start to where they're going towards. Now that causes a temporary disruption of that delocalized pi bonding system. And the way we represent that is by an open horseshoe and a positive charge. The positive charge is showing that an electron has been removed from that delocalized bonding system at the minute in order to form the bond with the nitronium ion. I'm drawing in a hydrogen now because the hydrogen is, is now relevant. It was always there, but it's now relevant. And I'm going to draw, bring um, in my next curly arrow, which is showing that this, this delocalized pi bonding system is pulling all the electrons that it can get into it, and it will be able to retrieve one from that carbon to hydrogen bond. That allows for the delocalized pi bonding system to be re-established Okay, it's pretty much impossible to break that under anything but phenomenally extreme circumstances. We've now got an NO2 group and we have to account for an H+. Plus. Now, you might say to me that we're not shown here how or why um, sulfuric acid is a catalyst. Well, this H+, plus that's here, will combine the HSO4-, minus, which is made in this stage and we will get H2SO4. So you will see we had H2SO4 at the start. We've regenerated H2SO4 so H2SO4 is therefore considered to be a catalyst. It plays a role in the in the reaction as catalysts do. However it is regenerated at the end of that reaction. Okay, so that's that's the mechanism, guys. Um, I think I've hopefully covered all bases there uh, and tried to say things which crop up in exam situations so that you are aware of them. Hopefully that helps for any of you who didn't either understand it in class today or having a bit of difficulty with it at home.